All right, whiskey lovers, are you ready to find out what the top 10 most overrated bourbons are out there? Well, stick around because we've got the list. So first of all, let's go through the disclaimers so all of you don't get your panties in a wad. The first thing that you need to know, these are my personal opinions. You may think that there is no amount of hype that would be enough for these bourbons and that's totally okay. Neither one of us are wrong. Number two, I'm not picking on Buffalo Trace. If you're gonna make a video about hyped bourbons, the producer that makes most of the hyped bourbons is definitely gonna have a big showing in the list, so understand that. Number three is every single one of these bourbons on the list is great at MSRP. If you can buy it for the amount the distillery would want the store to sell it for, you should absolutely buy it every time you see it. I'm mostly talking about these bottles being sold on the secondary or at price gouge stores. Let's just jump into it. Number one is Blanton's. Now, again, I'm not saying that Blanton's is not delicious whiskey. In fact, I frequently tell people, if you taste Blanton's and you think that it tastes bad, it's because you don't like bourbon. And that's totally okay. Blanton's is now in a space of ultra premium whiskeys but Blanton's was arguably the first ultra premium whiskey to come out of the bourbon dark ages, okay? That's what it was designed for. It was designed to kick the crap out of a, you know, regular label Jack Daniels or a regular label Jim Beam. It wasn't even made for people in the United States. It was made to be 93 proof, which would have been a few proof points above most of its competition because back then Jack Daniels was 86, right? So a few proof points above. And it was a monster of a product when it first came out and it did very, very well. But nowadays, it doesn't compare as well to the ultra premium whiskeys that are being released. And I think that people fail to understand that when you're first in a category and then you don't evolve, you don't change, right? The base level Blanton single barrel has not changed since they originally released it. It's not gonna compete well with the stuff that just came out last year that was designed to do well in this particular market. And so some of the hate's not fair, but if you spend a bunch of time chasing a Blanton's and you finally get your hands on it, maybe you bought it on the secondary for some astronomical amount of money and you open it up, you're gonna be disappointed. And you're gonna feel like, hey, this probably was not worth the effort. Blanton's is perfect at doing what it was designed to do and it's solid whiskey. Number two on the list is Weller 12 Year. Now, again, nothing wrong with Weller 12 year, except that it's a little bit too watered down. It's only a 90 proof product. And I think that for most of us that are expecting a really premium pour, we want something that's a little bit more robust, a little bit more bold. And when a whiskey starts to get up above 10 years, 10, 11, 12 years, aged in a new charred oak container, it's gonna extract tannins out of that barrel. And those tannins can come across as bitter, and I find that when you take a 12 year old whiskey or older and you water it all the way down to 90 proof, that those bitter flavors tend to be what stick out and you don't taste as much of the, you know, fruity flavors as much as the vanilla flavors and caramels that you're used to in a bourbon. So it's just a little bit too light, a little bit too weak, and it might be disappointing if you really struggle to find the bottle. Number three. Weller Single Barrel. Now this is the one that's got kind of the orange label on it and it's, it's really good bourbon. But the problem with it is that it's pretty common to find that for so sale in a price gouge store for $800 to $1,000 and they're super expensive on the secondary as well. But it's just regular Weller, except that it's a single barrel. So the purpose of this product was to give Weller consumers the opportunity to taste the barrel variants that the distillery deals with when they're blending to make a consistent batch product. It wasn't meant to make some unicorn that was supposed to be super expensive and that's why its MSRP is only $49.99. And the fact that this bottle has become this big get, and I think it's from people trying to collect the entire Weller series, it, it, it's, it's just ridiculous. This is a bottle that should not be up that high. And if you end up paying $800 or $1,000 for it, I think that you may walk away from that feeling a little disappointed. Number four is Weller C-Y-P-B. That stands for Choose Your Perfect Bourbon. And I feel like this one's a little bit overhyped because the only difference between this and other Weller offerings is that it was crowdsourced, right? And then they put a white label on it. 
Um, it's, it's not as high of proof as, say, Weller Antique. And why would crowdsource information from random Joes be better than the expertise of a master distiller creating a, 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 a recipe for a label, right? Like the fact that it's crowdsourced does not increase the odds that it's going to be a better product. And I have it and I've had it and it's really good whiskey. But you know, when you see it going up in price in the $650, $700 range and you see stores selling it for $800, $900, it just doesn't make a lot of sense and it feels like you know it's a little bit too low proof and if you pay a really large amount for it you're going to be disappointed number five van Winkle lot b some people call this uh pappy 12 year if you do that some people are going to get upset because it's not a pappy it's van Winkle lot b um, it's got the same problem as weller 12 in fact they're the same juice same barrels same aging area same everything it's just that the Weller 12-year barrels get selected to go into Van Winkles uh, because apparently they taste more like Van Winkle than just regular Weller. Uh, the proof is a little bit too low. And my main problem with Van Winkle Lot B is that it could have been William LaRue Weller. So a lot of people don't realize this, but Buffalo Trace, this is one of the only instances where the same barrels get made into three different products. And the first product is Weller 12. The second is Van Winkle Lot B, another 12 year product. But a lot of people don't realize this. William LaRue Weller is the same juice also at 12 years old, typically. It's not an age stated, but if you look it up, typically it's on the higher end of the 12 year range. And all that means is, is if they had not put all that water in it to water it down to 90.4 proof, which is what Lot B is, it could have been William LaRue Weller, which I enjoy much more. Hey, Wes. Hey, man. I'm here. What are you doing? I'm here for the bottles, sure. Oh. Uh, wow. Well, so you just carried all this? Well, I put them in my seat, and I uh, kind of put the seatbelt over them and things just to keep them from... But this one did fall on the ground. I hope it's okay. Yeah. 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 Sometimes I'm you I'm good. You know, I just couldn't... Dis I couldn't decide really what I wanted to bring. So well, I, all. I recommend that you get one of these. Oh, a Mary Poppins bag? Yes. It's very similar to what Mary Poppins would carry, except for it holds whiskey. Ooh, okay, tell me more. All right, so Bourbon Real Talk has had this custom designed for whiskey lovers. Nothing like this has ever existed before. Ever. It's been designed to hold nice. all bottles, okay? Every, so like size, even a huh? wide bottle like this one, look at it, it fits right in there. Ooh. Super tall bottles like E.H. Taylor, no problem. What about the Fits Slipper right fork? in there. Right Leaper's Fork. Oh, Look at wow. this, even the weird shaped like scotch-like bottles. Hey, like this is a weird, I bet this one doesn't fit. No, nope, that one's gonna fit just fine, I promise. Oh, wow, okay, and then we've got, so how many can you fit in here? I mean, You yeah. can fit six in here. Ooh. If this is something that you need because you carry bottles places, Head on over to bourbonrealtalk.com and pick one of these bad boys yeah. up. If you want to look really cool at your next tasting that you show up to a bottle share, walk in with one of these Mary Poppins bourbon bags <laughs> and just keep the bottles coming out of them. Keep just, them coming. And, and truth uh, be told, I've carried up to 10 bottles in this bag. All right. Because there's separation in between the padding, so you can fit two in the center, two on the sides, boom, yeah. 10 bottles. Boom. That's everything you need. Okay? Everything you need. That's what we're here for, to keep you hooked up with all the cool bourbon lover Chachkis. Chachkis. And also check out the other great things that are on bourbonrealtalk.com. Yeah, do it. I'll see y'all later. Number six, Pappy Van Winkle. 20 year and 23. Could have broken these up, but the notes are the same. So basically, Pappy Van Winkle helped create the bourbon renaissance. Love the brand. Uh, love old Rip Van Winkle love Pappy 15, but Pappy 20 and Pappy 23, they go a little bit too far. Um, they, they, there's, there's too much oak influence, too many tannins are extracted from that barrel. Um, it, 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 in fact, when whiskey gets to a certain age, during the aging process, things are being filtered out of the whiskey by the charcoal layer, and there are things that are evaporating with the angel share, and some of the things that it's losing are congeners flavor compounds that make bourbon taste like bourbon. And the Pappy 23 that I had, or the Pappy 20 that I owned and the Pappy 23s that I've tried, they've lost too many of those fruity esters, too much of the vanillin, too much of the things that make it taste like bourbon. And it almost starts to have a austere taste, like, um, like, like almost an olive juice, like a vinegar. 
And so I've given Pappy 20 to people and then asked them if it was reminiscent of a dirty martini to them. And almost universally, everybody said yes. And so it, it, there's just not enough of that bourbon flavor. Uh, keep in mind, Pappy uh, 20 and 23 were a product that were created to basically appeal to scotch drinkers that were used to higher age statements on premium products. At the time that Pappy 20 and 23 were created, there weren't a lot of industry experts that knew about bourbon that thought that bourbon tastes good at that age. Um, in fact, some of them thought that that was whiskey that nobody wanted and that's why it got that old. Um, nowadays, we pay, place a premium on those older flavors, but uh, Pappy 20 and 23, definitely not worth the hype, not worth the secondary prices. And for the effort that you gotta go for them, Ah, you may be disappointed unless you luck out and get one at MSRP. Number seven, Eagle Rare 17. I'm sorry, people, but it's just too low of a proof. Um, now, it used to be 90 proof. They raised it up to 100. Since then, I've enjoyed those bottles a whole lot more than I used to. But my main problem with Eagle Rare 17 is that it's the same thing as George T. Stagg, just about two years older. Typically, George T. Stagg is around a 15 year product, again, non age stated, so it could vary. But if you look up recently, it's typically 15 years. Leave that same juice in the barrel because they're both Buffalo Trace mashed by one for two extra years. Water it down to 100 proof and bada bing, bada boom, you've turned George T. Stagg the beautiful, elegant product that it is into Eagle Rare 17. And I just prefer the George C. Stag. I don't like my wa whiskey water down that much. So if you pay one of those big hefty secondary prices, you may be disappointed. Number eight, Elijah Craig 18. Same problem as Pappy 20 and 23. Too much time in the barrel. It's been watered down too much. Too many of those bitter tannin flavors and starts to taste a little like a dry martini. Number nine, Henry McKenna, 10 year. Um, so this one is an interesting one. Henry McKenna blew up because it won the spirits competition. It was named the best bourbon in the world. The problem with that is that Henry McKenna is a single barrel. And there's been some people who've argued that Heaven Hill may have cherry picked a really good barrel and sent those bottles in for the competition. I can tell you, I've had a number of bottles of Henry McKenna 10 year and none of them have been bad, but none of them have been anywhere near good enough to say that they were the best bourbon in the world. And so I feel like if you read that, you saw that it was the best bourbon in the world and you struggled to find a bottle and you finally find one and you open it up, you're gonna be disappointed because it's just really solid bourbon, not the best in the world. Number 10, we are going to throw in Smoke Wagon Single Barrel as well as Smooth Ambler Old Scout. They are the same product. So the truth is, is that those products, when they have those high age statements that everybody likes to chase after, those are whiskey that was made by MGPI out of Lawrenceburg, Indiana. Really super solid whiskey. The problem that I have with these bottles is that they've started to trade for like a thousand dollars on the secondary. They were never intended to be that. When they first were released, they were like $60 bottles and they were solid. At $60, you got one, you opened up, you thought it was great. I used to drink Smooth Amblers all the time. There was a local store here. He got involved in doing picks early on. He always had these great single barrel picks. <clears throat> but now that those picks are selling for over a thousand dollars, I feel like it's it's overhyped. And part of the reason for that is there are other companies that release that same juice, but because it's not in that bottle, y'all don't tater over it. You know, nobody's going out and spending a thousand dollars for Remus Repeal Reserve, right? It's the same thing. And there are other whiskeys that I could have thrown in this category. I've seen Blom Brothers do things like that with the MGPI juice. But <clears throat> in, in back just a few years ago, 2018, people made fun of other people who thought MGPI was something special, right? Now, back then when I tasted it, I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. This is great tasting whiskey. But it would be common for whiskey nerds to be like, why are you saying such great things about that bottle? It's just MGPI. Well, now we've learned MGPI makes amazing bourbon and some of those bottles have started to trade on the secondary. But if you pay a thousand plus dollars for a bottle of Old Scout or, you know, Smoke Wagon, eh, you may be disappointed. So if this is your first time tuning in, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our show philosophy. We are about connecting people through 
bourbon. A connection is something that's near and dear to my heart because I did lose a loved one to suicide in 2014. And in the aftermath of all of that, I was trying to find a way to help others avoid that fate. And I started to notice through my hobby of whiskey, the connective power of bourbon and how it brought people together. So I had the thought that if I can get you guys connected to whiskey, maybe whiskey will do the rest of the job and get you connected to other people. And so that's part of the reason why we started this podcast. Now, as I've gone through this journey in whiskey and gotten deeper involved in social media, I have observed that there are people out there that will say very hateful things to strangers online that they don't know. But that made me realize that if somebody can hate you online that doesn't really know you, it's just as easy for me to love you. And that's why I sign off every podcast the same way. And that's this. If you woke up this morning and you're unsure whether or not anyone loved you, just know that I love you. And I'll see you next time on Bourbon Real Talk. Are you... <laughs> ready? Am I ready? I don't know if I'm ready. You just drink a whole flight of... I'm not even buzzed. Uh, remember, I just uh, almost lost a million dollars, so I'm, I have capacity for extra now. A whiskey troll is a person who seeks negative attention and uses contrarian attitudes to derail civil discussion in online forums. They communicate in ways they never would face to face because they're keyboard warriors. Their only goal is to make other people feel inferior. Hey guys, I'm new here. I just got my first blatant. And trust me, you probably paid way too much. I don't care much about the Blantons, but nice <laughs> There's no way that she didn't buy that at secondary, <laughs> idiot. Oh, I know how you got that bottle. So, are you sick and tired of the whiskey trolls running your fun online? Well, that's why we started Bourbon Real Talk Community. Congratulations. Let me know what you think when you open it up. Hey, welcome to the group. Let me send you over a sample of Blanton's Gold and straight from the barrel. See how you like those. I remember back to my first bottle of Blanton's. It was the birthday to my son and we enjoy it every year on his birthday. Congrats. So if you're looking to connect with some people online who aren't head over to facebook.com and join Bourbon Real Talk community today.